Philippians. Paul's letter to the Philippians, beginning in verse 4-4 to the end. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever's true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now, at last, you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Now that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what I have. I know what it is to have little. And I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share in my distress. You Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel when I left Macedonia, No church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I have been paid in full, and I have more than enough. I am fully satisfied. And now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To God and the Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The friends who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those in the emperor's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of the Lord. In the last five Sundays, we have now read every word of the book of Philippians. Isn't that neat? I I think that's really neat. I I, I always like knowing I've completed things, you know, getting credit for, for a whole book. I try to do that whenever I can. It's kind of like buying a whole chicken, you know, and parting it up and eating it for for five meals, and you know you had, you had the whole chicken. It's, it's all there. And even if you haven't been here every week for the past five weeks, you're, you're a part of a community where the whole of the Bible is being read, where, where we are, we're not picking and choosing and editing parts, but we're presenting whole letters, whole things. And, and it's not that it would be bad if we do things other ways. We, we're, we didn't read all of Isaiah, but, um, but I just think it's neat. I like it. And so... That's exciting, but I, I wanted to read it all because of that, but I'm going to be focusing on the content that comes at the beginning of the reading. So I want to read that part again because I want it to be fresh in your mind. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. 
Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything. But in everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Don't you want that? The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. It will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And keep on doing the things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. The God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly. I like audiobooks. I, I often listen to audiobooks, and uh, especially when I'm in the car, I like to listen to audio Bibles. Um, it's a great, it's actually a great kind of life hack if you have trouble getting through, you know, First and Second Chronicles, because you turn a page and you're like, I don't know if I remembered anything from that page. The, the audio book, it'll get you through it. But um, I, audio Bibles are really fun. I have one audio Bible. It's the King James Version. Um, James Earl Jones does the voice of God. Do you know who James Earl Jones is? Yeah, he's the voice of Darth Vader. He's got this very deep, booming voice. <laughs> it's, it's really fun. I, I, uh, I had a, a youth pastor at a, at a mission trip I was on once, and he was saying, you know, I always think, I think when we read the epistles of Paul, we should get somebody to read the epistles as a valley girl. I think, I think Paul would have made a good, like, California valley girl. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be fun if you could just be like, whatever yeah. is true, yeah. whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, Think on these things. Oh my God! I rejoice in you greatly. I think that'd be fun. He gives Paul. Paul gives an incredibly bold, incredibly broad instruction here. And, and it's worth highlighting. It's worth reading three times. It's worth talking about in different ways the broadness of it. He says, what ever. In the original Greek, that means whatever. One would assume it's hyperbole. It, it, that it, that it, it can't possibly be taken literally if it were not for the fact that this comes at the culmination of everything we've seen, everything we've learned so far in the book of Philippians. This is the conclusion to the book, and it follows from his argument. Humiliation leads to exaltation. Kenosis leads to shining like stars. Christ died and he rose, and we follow Christ. We struggle. And we rise up and up and up. And so he ends this book on this incredibly high note. He's been going up and down and up and down and up and up and up. And I've talked about these, these kind of high notes. I've talked about positivity in, in, in various meetings and in various continuing ed classes and, and how can we... Um, be, be excited about new things and, and not look first for problems, but look first for opportunities and then aim to solve the problems. And I've, I've started to get the feedback, Ryan, you're just really into positivity. You know, you're just, I, I get that that's like a thing with you, and it's not. It's not a thing with me. It's not like the fact that I like chicken wings. It's not like an opinion that I have. It's what the Bible says. Think on these things. There's somebody that is in this congregation that I think is an excellent example of positivity. And I, I want to follow in the 
image of Paul who, who lifted up people, lifted up Timothy and Epaphroditus and said, you know, like these people, they're not perfect, but they're pretty good examples. Rick Stevenson, in, in the midst of deep difficulties in life, has maintained an incredible heart. And he has a poem he'd like to share. I want to hand the pulpit over to Rick. Rick, would you come up and share with us? <clears throat> Do I need to press something, John? Hello. John's not here. Oh, why don't you use the lectern mic? I think. Hello. Oh, there we go. I'll just stand here. <laughs> um, the Lord's given me quite a few things over the years um, that I've written down, and uh, it's all been direct by direct inspiration of the Lord. It's, um, it's just amazing some of, some of the things that uh, he's allowed me to write down, and I've been very grateful for them. And of course, I haven't done anything with them, but this is one that he gave me uh, quite a few years back, and it's about the apostles and their walk with Christ and and what they went through to uh, bring the message, the gospel, to us. And it says, it starts like this: It says, most people think that Christians are a people with a dream with door-to-door -door alliance and a message to redeem. But the ones that came before us with the truth on how to live, through sweat and blood and hunger, gave us all they had to give. They were James and Simon Peter, Matthew, Philip, Jude, and Tom, and Bartholomew and Andrew, Simon, Judas, James, and John. Some were just beheaded and others stoned and crucified, but not before the gospel told the world why Jesus died. And from the time they heard the calling of a man from Galilee, they left all they left behind them, just because it had to be. And they wandered over mountains and the dry and desert lands to live and breathe the gospel and obey the Son of Man. And for years they followed Jesus until the ending of his life. And they learned to live with sorrow as they learned to live with strife. And except for one who hung himself for something he had done, they all retained the promise of the work they had begun. And through power, signs, and wonders, they proclaimed the Son of Man, and they told how they had witnessed how he died and rose again. They were beaten and imprisoned, but their hearts were spirit-filled, and they all proclaimed the gospel until the day that they were killed. They were James and Simon Peter, Matthew, Philip, Jude, and Tom, Bartholomew and Andrew, Simon, Judas, James, and John. Some are just beheaded and others stoned and crucified, but not before the gospel told the world why Jesus died. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> Rick, I, I, I just want to interview you for a minute in, in front of these people, if I can, if we can do a sort of inside the actor's studio. Um, because, I, I, I mean, you're not perfect. You, but but you, I mean, I mean, this teaching, I feel like, is something you've internalized. Like, you're living uh, in, in Orlando in modern times, a lot of the same things Paul was living. Paul was a man who was in prison, facing the real possibility, if not probability, of death. Paul, Paul was martyred. And, and you're... Uh, You've been diagnosed with multiple cancers in your body. How, how do you deal with that and, and still come to church and smile at me every week? What, where does that come from in you? It's, it just comes from, it comes from the Lord. I mean, I know that no matter what happens, that everything's going to be okay. You know, the thing that hurts me the most is what I'm leaving behind. is my, my wife and my kids. You know, that's, that hurts the most. Yeah. I mean, I know beyond a shadow of doubt. I mean, I've had so many encounters with God, one-on-one -on -one encounters, that there leaves no question whatsoever about God's existence. It's not even a thing of belief anymore. It's a knowing, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so it's a win-win for me either way. You know, if I die, I get to go be with the Lord in paradise, and if I live, I get to stay here and pretty much paradise with my <laughs> wife and kids and, and, um, and retirement. So, you know, I mean... It, it's a win-win for me, but unfortunately, it's not for my family. That uh, that sounds a lot like what Paul said: that to live is Christ, to die is gain. Right? I don't I don't know where I'm headed, but I I, I trust it'll it'll be what God needs. And I just 
I, I preached at Westminster this last week, and I, I'm so often um, humbled by the wisdom in this room. And, and I, I shared with them that. I, I, I talked about you know, being the, the youngest, one of the youngest people that sits in this room and, and how much more some of you have to teach about some of these issues than I do in some ways. Thank you very much for sharing and, and for being an example and a part of this. Um, and all of you, in various ways, I, I pick on Rick because he can kind of take it and he doesn't mind the spotlight, but, but all of you in various ways are embodying pieces of the gospel that, um, that the rest of us need to learn from and grow from and, and engage with. <clears throat> so, this command, I, and it is, it's, it's a biblical command, rejoice in the Lord always, to dwell on the good, on the commendable, on the pure. It's, it's hard. I, I don't do it well. I, I, I don't do it as well as some people. I don't do it as well as Rick. I don't do it as well as some of you. And, and yet I, I recognize the truth of it and I endeavor to do it. And I do it better than some other people, right? I'll, I'll be so, that exalted. I, I work in this way. And, and as I was praying and as I was setting this message up, I, the, the question that ran through my head was, okay, what about the how? Right? It's, it's one thing to say we should do this. It's another thing to, to say, what, I, I, I have difficult feelings. What, what do I do with those? What's, how, how do I do it? And, and of course, Paul in Philippians gives part of that answer. Right? You, you dwell in the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you meditate on Christ. You follow Christ. And as you follow Christ, this is where you end up. And so you know that that's the goal, but that's a little bit ephemeral, that's a little bit beyond, it's, it, it doesn't seem practical. And I, I think one practical piece of advice that's helpful besides that is to recognize the narratives that run in our life that run counter to the gospel. To recognize the number of messages we get bombarded with on a daily basis that contradict this. And the fact that if there is resistance in our hearts to this message, that it probably has to do with what we've seen on TV, with what we've heard on the radio, with what is being passed around the water cooler. Because the world wants us to focus on the negative. The world wants us to think about bad and scary things. It tells us that our responsibility increases, that, that our maturity comes from negativity, that growing up means knowing about all the bad stuff. How often have you heard, if you're not angry, you're not paying attention? You know, this political climate, if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. Clearly, you're just inept unless you are having really negative emotions. Or, or have you ever heard the, well, you really need to be educated on the dangers of blank. Fill in the blank. It can be anything. It can be, you know, oral vitamins or smartphones or, uh, I saw one about LED traffic lights. Apparently, they don't melt snow. Uh, it's just, they just want you to focus on whatever is bad, whatever is harmful, whatever is scary, whatever is new and different and uncomfortable, and they want you to dwell there and make your home there. And they think that that's, they tell you that's what makes you strong. And it's a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell. And the world tells you these things, the culture tells you these things, because Satan encourages it to, and because it wants you to buy. It, it wants you to want. It, and you can't want new things if you're happy. You're immune, you can't be sold. So if I wanna sell you something, what I have to do is I have to make you unhappy. 
I have, I have to convince you that really, actually, you didn't know it, but you're miserable. You're scared. You're, you're incompetent, but it's okay for just three easy payments of $9.99. I can fix you. That's the only way. I have to make you unhappy. The Bible says the opposite. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I have everything I need. I have contentment in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you notice the contrast, it actually starts to get really funny. I, I have a video for you. I'm, I'm going to put it up. What, what this video is, is this is a compilation of the black and white portions of infomercials. You ever see an infomercial? And there's always somebody, that, you know, that, who's like, ah, my hair! It is, I do not have the spina curva. And it's, like, just watch these when they come together. When, when we put more than one of them next to each other. It, go, go ahead, Keyshawn. Oh, yeah, do you ever forget how to hold things entirely? What? Oh, no, pouring. Oh, oh, I just decided not to hold popcorn anymore. <laughs> Sitting down. Oh. Sitting down is so hard. Oh, if only I could have a device that could sit down for me so that when I have a tray on my lap, I won't. Because every time, I just throw it. I don't know why that is. But that's my life, isn't it? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous what they try to sell you on. They, they, they try to convince you of the problems that you don't really have. But you know, you know what does it even worse than infomercials? You, you, know, you know one of the ways that the culture runs this narrative into your life is the news. If it bleeds, it leads. If, if, it, if someone is suffering and dying, that's what we put on the main headline. That's a saying in the newspaper industry. And make no mistake, they want to sell you things just as much as the infomercials do. They want to sell you an ideology. They want to sell you a worldview. They also want to sell you a newspaper. And it's just a whole lot more compelling if you say, what is in your tap water that might be killing your children? Stay tuned, than it is if they say, well, um, we actually cleaned the tap water. It's cleaner than it used to be. Um, so know that. We'll talk more about it. But that's the info you need. All right, they won't tell you that. You never open a newspaper and read, like, happy family has a pretty good day. That's not going to be printed. It won't work. You won't buy that paper. What you're going to get is what might happen if the politician I'm running against wins. Oh, what might happen? You'll, you'll, you'll get editorials about all the possible hypothetical things that might go wrong. And if you're like me, and you think you're safe because you just don't read the paper, you get all your news on the internet, you're not safe. Because nothing makes someone hit that share button like bad news. Hit share or Mark Zuckerberg will steal your identity. You have to pass this to 50 people or you're in trouble. I, I'm, I'm going to say something controversial here. I'm going to say something, a, a, a theological statement about bad news. And I, I just, I want you to follow because... You might disagree, but I believe this. Bad news is the opposite of good news. It just, it just is. It's the opposite of the gospel. And yet I worry that some of you are thinking, Ryan, this has been a pretty negative sermon. <laughs> You've been talking about a lot of a lot of things that are negative and saying that negativity is bad. And does that mean that I get to ignore everything you just said? <laughs> Not listen to you? Because I, I kind of have some pet 
anxieties, some concerns, and I kind of I feed them, and I, I kind of take care of those anxieties and help them to grow. And I, and I just want you to notice if you've got a part of yourself, because we all have different parts of ourselves, if you've got a part of yourself that's doing that, notice yourself doing that. I'm, I'm trying to use humor. I'm trying to, to give some kind of anesthetic before surgery, because this is, a, this is a hard issue, and often laughing and making fun of something helps with that. But it is true that I do more than Paul of enumerating what not to do. I hope you won't hold my speech writing skills against Paul's point. He, in Philippians, stays away from bad things for the whole book. I, I, I mean, he drops in occasionally, you know, in the, in the midst of a good sentence, he'll drop a, in this crooked and depraved generation, right? He, it, it's not that the bad goes away, but he's choosing to focus on the good in the midst of a really bad time in his life. It's not that Paul doesn't recognize that there are problems. Paul recognizes problems. He, he also spends several, he, he has problems, and, and, and he recognizes problems in other people, and he spends several entire epistles attacking other people's problems directly, saying, this is bad, this is how you fix it, this is why. That's, I mean, that's Galatians for you, that's Colossians. But, it's not a contradiction that he directs us to say, whenever you can, meditate on the good. Dwell on the good. Build your home there. That's that, that Hebrew word yeshav. This isn't a Hebrew book, but that's a, that's a concept, right? Put, put your yeshav, the, the, the place where you settle down, put it in the good. Because God is good. And good is good. If the culture tells us that responsibility, that being informed, being helpful, being insightful, being successful comes from criticism. It comes from know thy enemy. The gospel says the opposite. It says that the bad happens, but you get better, you get more righteous, you get more humble, you get more exalted by knowing God. By imitating the image of Christ. And that when you fall into the bad, when life isn't all sunshine and roses, which it's not. Don't hear me saying it is. Cancer is real. And sometimes the depression, sometimes the fear, the embarrassment, the grief overtakes us. And we have to reach up from the pit and ask for help. We have to ask for help from God. We have to ask for help from our Christian neighbors. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. When you're suffering, you ask for help. That's the right thing to do. When you're in depression, you see a doctor and you take medication and you get with people and you fix it so that you can get back to where you live, to where you belong. God wants to rescue us from that and seat us with him. The culture wants us to live there. It wants us to believe that when we criticize, when we complain, when we critique, that we are helping. We're not helping when we complain. Sometimes we complain. Sometimes I complain. But what I'm doing when I complain is I'm asking for help. Right? It's, it's the opposite of helping. I'm, I'm saying, this problem bothers me. Can you help me with it? Paul in Philippians asked for and received help. We need help to find our way home. Home to joy, home to contentment. Home to a feeling of closeness with God, a security not in the national defense system or in our alarms or in the more expensive neighborhood we've moved to, but security in knowing that we are beloved by God and nothing can take that away. And we deny the cultural narrative that the brokenness of this world is our home. Our citizenship, it says in Philippians, is in heaven. And that's what the book of Philippians 
really leads us to. Sometimes religious people keep using words after they no longer um, are used commonly in the culture. We started saying blessing a long time ago when the English language was different. Blessed didn't used to be a religious word. What a blessing is is a gift. And to bless someone is to make them happy. And I want you to be happy as I, I give this blessing. So I want you to know the meaning of that word when I say may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.